Be. And we are live. Uh, hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Starting in the Middle. This is a live episode, and Starting in the Middle is the show where I uh, talk about creative projects that aren't quite done. And I've got two guests joining me today. I've got Nathan Pauletta and Phil Lewis. Uh, so if uh, I could have them introduce themselves. Nathan, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and what you're working on? Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Nathan. Um, I'm a self-publisher and uh, independent designer and uh, freelancer as well, so I'm doing lots of uh, character sheet stuff for my own stuff and then also as a freelance graphic artist. Um, and right now I'm working on a bunch of freelance stuff, including for Phil here, and uh, also keeping starting a new, a new chapter in my uh, Patreon journey, so you can check out my ongoing work, which includes a lot of graphic work when I'm in those stages of projects at uh, patreon.com slash ndpoletta. That's my plug. All right, and Phil? Hi, Phil Lewis. Um, mainly just working on one thing, just uh, Wrath of the Autark, which I've been working on for a few years now. It's a kingdom-building game. And since I have very little in the way of graphic design skills, Nathan is doing most of the hard work there. Um, and, and yeah, that's been it. So that, that's pretty much my main project. It's fun. I, I probably will do more game stuff and I have more ideas, but this is the sole focus right now. Excellent. Uh, so the talk we're going to be doing today is about character sheet design. Uh, some of the different ways you can test a character sheet that you have and some of the ways that your design will evolve thanks to that testing and also how designing a character sheet influences the design of the game and how the changing design of the game uh, changes the what you need on the character sheet. Uh, so we've each got a couple of uh, example sheets that we're going to show you to start things off, sort of start with the old and then move toward the new and show uh, discuss how we tested them to get the feedback we needed to change from the old to the new. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start off uh, the discussion. Had a little bit of footage that uh, can't show you thanks to the technical requirements of Hangouts, uh, but I'll be producing an edited video using this Hangout in the, at, in the future, uh, so you'll be able to see it then. But I actually do some semi-blind uh, testing for the character sheets, meaning I will sit down with someone that um, has never played my game before and has never uh, seen the character sheet before. And without telling them anything about the game, I actually put the character sheet in front of them and ask them to just think out loud and read out loud as they look over the character sheet to see what the character sheet by itself is telling them. And I do this in part because the character sheet is one of the primary uh, points of user interface with a game. So it's the thing, it's the one artifact people probably put their eyes on the most for most role-playing games. Uh, so they need to be able to learn a lot from a character sheet, and the character sheet says a lot about the game itself. So by seeing what people are taking away from that, I can learn what I need to change, what I need to move, what should be on the sheet, and some things maybe that shouldn't be on the sheet at all. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and show you uh, one of the sheets that I recently tested in this way. And here is the original uh, sheet. So you can see, uh, got the standard player and character information up here, uh, some description area, start with your stats in the middle, and you've got all this uh, mechanical stuff on the far right. Uh, and there's a lot of text on the front of this sheet. And I got a lot of great feedback, some of which you'll be able to see in the future. Uh, but we'll, before I go into what that feedback was specifically uh, and what I did with it, I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, Phil and Nathan if they want to talk about how some of the ways they get feedback for the sheets they're designing right now. Um, sure, yeah, I don't mind <clears throat> talking about that. So I don't... I've never tried to do it the way you're describing that kind of almost semi-blind like feedback where you're kind of like here's the sheet. Um, I that's that's an interesting way to do it though. I I mostly iterate with largely the same group of people. I have kind of a I have a couple of groups that I mainly play with, and um, <clears throat> so 
evolution-wise, I think the feedback comes, you know, there's kind of there's kind of the two there's kind of two two threads of the feedback that I get. There's kind of the usability of of a sheet. It's like, oh, why is this in the book? Why isn't this on the sheet? Like, I don't want to have to look this up. So there's there's the usability side, which I've gone that expands and contracts because I've I've actually gone too far sometimes in putting stuff on sheets when when I realize like, well, I just need to put stuff in the book, but make it easier to find. But and then the the second type is, you know, what what's on the sheet is what people want to do and play, right? So so if, if there's some feature on the sheet that draws their attention, they they, you know, that becomes the focal point of something they want to do. And if it's if it turns out not to be as fun as we thought to do and play, then it then the sheet kind of drives design. Um, so yeah, so I I think that that my feedback tends to go along those two lines mostly, you know. Okay. I don't know what if, if Nathan has anything to add or <laughs> Yeah, um I'm uh, kind of probably in, in between those positions uh just in how my my process tends to run because I'm very selfish. Um I usually use my playtests uh and the the sheet itself um to to kind of test whether what I think should be on there should actually be on there, kind of uh, as opposed to like I don't think I would I don't think I've ever um, been interested I don't I mean I think it's a totally great way to go about it and super smart, but personally I've never really been interested in like here's here's the sheet you know tell tell me what you think you know give me your feedback on on this kind of absent the context of play. Um, part of this is probably also because I'm often teaching games as I run them or for playtests, so I use the sheet as like the focal point of like, here's how the game works. In this area, you have this information and that's relevant at this time. In this area, you have this these stats and here's what they mean. Um, so I often use the sheet as a, a teaching aid in that way. And then I'll usually take sheets back after a playtest and see how people use them and where they they like put notes on it or like what they wrote in the spaces and that kind of thing. Uh, and I usually get some pretty good uh, just kind of ephemeral information from that that's a little more uh, uh, rooted in in the play itself. Um, so it's kind of in between those things. But I'm usually what I like like what I want the character sheet to do for my for my work is. Uh, kind of focus all the relevant information down to like here's what you need, which I think we we, we all want to do that, right? Like here's what you need, uh, here's what's relevant, and then um, more and more uh, the kinds of games I tend to design, I try to have like references on the sheet to the specific mechanics and that kind of thing. Uh, so that they 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 aid in instructional looking up things at the table as well. Great. And one other question about um, the relationship that you guys have to work with because I know you're separated, uh, you're, you're a time zone apart, uh, so you're not meeting in person uh, for Phil to give Nathan the feedback. So working with a graphic designer, something a lot of game designers end up doing. So how do you, um, Phil, how do you communicate that feedback to Nathan? And then, Nathan, how do you uh, take that feedback and use that to generate kind of a new version of a sheet? Um, <clears throat> so, so far, uh, I already, since, since I, I kind of had my own sheets that I was using to this point, uh, that was kind of the this, this starting point um, for sort of saying, here's, Here's you know how it how, how what I have now and then, um, and 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 that gave I think a pretty good starting point, but and then when we've iterated on it so far we've all, I've only done it through um, we've only done it through email, um, and that's usually just kind of critiquing um, you know just from either feedback from players or or. Just knowing the design, having a, a little bit, you know, knowing what pieces maybe aren't called out as much as maybe others that could be, 
and then I just try to draw attention to that, and then Nathan has to decipher my email, and then figure out what to do w with all those notes, uh, and he's pretty good at that, so so that works pretty well. I don't know. We may at at some point have to. Um, I don't know. We may we may do something like a hangout or at some point. I don't know, but so far it's it's been okay that way. I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm pretty comfortable with like doing back and forth email stuff. So I think that's been fine. Um, it's been really interesting for me because uh, I'm kind of. This is, it's good because um, Phil's kind of taking the actual information from his play tests and like filtering it through like, oh, here's what's actually important and here's what I actually need to have and like here's what came up in play that like actually is is just useless information on this sheet or should be on a different sheet or whatever. So he's doing all that filtering first and then sending me an email that's like, you know. This can this can be two lines, and I'm changing this anyway, so take it off. And this field is too big, and you know whatever. Um, so uh, that critical decision making process is off of my shoulders, and I'm mostly kind of taking what what his insights are from his process and and translating them into the visual work. Um, and it's been pretty pretty seamless so far, I think. I mean, my main challenge is is uh, making, a, and this is for, a, um, I think, in terms of general advice for working with freelancers, is I'm uh, making a lot of uh, assumptions uh, to bridge gaps in what's been very specifically detailed. Like, uh, for example, there was a lot of, there are some, like, shaded parts on his original sheets that he sent me as, like, the starting point. And so I kind of had to bridge the gap of, like, is this shaded because these two things are important and this one isn't? Or they shaded because he just didn't click all the boxes in Excel, and you know it didn't make it all the way through. And then part of the revision process is me asking questions like, "Are these supposed to be shaded, or like, are these important? Should they be called out in some way?" Is more of the accurate question. Okay, uh, and since you're in the um, kind of w when you're working on your own stuff. You're working in both the game designer and graphic designer roles, so you're doing that filtering for yourself when you're working on your own stuff. Um, can I have each of you talk briefly about how you do some of that filtering, starting with you, Nathan? Sure. Uh, yeah, for for me, uh, time helps uh, coming back to to the sheet after, um, like doing the play tests and getting the information on the rule side, and then kind of doing rules revisions. And then revisiting the sheet later usually helps separate those two phases for me. Um, I'm usually not coming back from a from a play test and be like, "All right, this needs to change, and this needs to change on the play materials." Um, and kind of do the textual stuff first, and let that filter back in. Uh, though it, sometimes this what happens uh, is <clears throat> I'll make a layout decision on the sheet, and I'll have to change something to fit in a space or something, and that will uh, make me realize that a rule or something is like extraneous or could be written in a different way, and so that feeds back into the design process from from the sheet end as well. So, but keeping those separated for me with uh, usually a couple days or a week or whatever is is most useful for my process. All right, uh, Phil, how do you kind of take everything you see at the table, all the feedback, uh, all of your experiences in play running your game? and turn that into what you're sending to Nathan to have him change on the character sheets. Um, so let's see. There's, I mean, one thing is I'm lucky to have, the, the players that I have are very vocal about um, what they like and, and don't like. Uh, and so I've never had trouble soliciting feedback from my friends. Um, and and usually it's really good feedback, so so that's that's always nice. Um, but also just the kind of game it is, there's just a lot of ephemera because there's there's not just um, you know there's the sheets, but the, the, there's a lot of um, you know we write down things on note cards and there's like notes flying all, everywhere. Um, and I I usually am able to just kind of take all that together again and kind of sift through it to, to, to remember what happened during the game. Um, because I, I actually, 
you know, I'm not always the, at the best remembering even, you know, what happened while we're playing, because I'm playing, I'm playing with everyone else, so, uh, but because of that nature of the, of the sort of game it is, with the amount of just kind of, yeah, just, just pieces that, that everything's written down on, I'm usually able to piece it together, and then remember, like, this is important, this wasn't important, um, and that's where I get a lot of the feedback from. Although right now, a lot of it is, uh, I mean, there's not major design changes, uh, game design changes happening anymore, but there still are <clears throat> changes happening with, you know, just different pieces that are of varying importance I I've definitely pruned out or brought back in, and, um, and that's, that is a big part of that is how, is how they look on sheets. Um, and, and I guess another part of it is because it's a kingdom building game, there's a kingdom sheet too, so uh, that that has a whole different dimension because there's, you know, there's sheets where it's kind of like, well, this is my character sheet, so I am in control of it and I have it in front of me, but then there's this material where, you know, the games that have that where there's some kind of organizing um, force like a kingdom and that has different almost requirements than a character sheet might where you you sort of want to say you know well what what does our kingdom have how and and how easy for it, it how easy for it, for us you know is it to, for us to access that information and i found um that that can be tricky though there's there's two very i don't know they're two almost different design um philosophies behind those things. So that's so I I have lots of sheets, plenty of sheets. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting with your stuff and I think this applies to lots of things, um lots of games, but there's the uh there's the aspect of the sheet where it's um recording well, first of all, there's a difference between recording static information and dynamic information, right? Stuff that's like a number that's going to stay for a long time and stuff that's like hit points or whatever that you might be changing in, um, a lot in one session. So there's that. Uh, and then there's also this kind of difference between like a sheet that's more important to have in front of you while you play and then a, a, a sheet uh, that's more important to like record something so that next time you play that information has been preserved from one to another. And most character sheets kind of do both, right? Like, you're changing some stuff, and you have stuff to reference, and then you keep it, and the next time you play, you have it again. But um, in your case, you have kind of this whole aspect of the game that kicks in, uh, that doesn't kick in on every scene, right? Like, the, the stuff that only comes up on a session basis or even on a longer term. So you need these other sheets that are, like, might need to have more reminder text or might have to have more pointers to, like, uh, systems that, that are longer term that you need to pick up every couple sessions or whatever. Excellent. Uh, one That actually reminds me of some of the uh, design on the sheet that I'm going to be showing you again in a moment, uh, where I've separated out uh, into different columns the different kinds of information between uh, information that's likely to remain static, uh, perhaps throughout the entire lifetime of the character over several sessions, information that is going to change very infrequently, and information that is going to be changing frequently, like uh, you know, damage totals and experience and things like that. So I've actually separated that out because of the exact reasons you mentioned. Um, and I'll actually go ahead and share that screen again um, right now. And this information is a sort of basic character concept information that's unlikely to change during play. Uh, at most, you'll you'll move one of these ticks up or down once at some point during play, maybe, but probably not. They're sort of, uh, given the genre that this game falls into, these things tend to be very static for characters. And then when we move into attributes and skills, these things will advance occasionally during play but very rarely, so they're in the middle here. But the stuff all the way over on the right uh, is the sort of stuff that changes, you know, maybe multiple times per session. So it's all the way on the right, and I put it all the way on the right so that most right-handed people won't smudge anything as they're writing and rewriting and erasing. And I've actually, the plan is actually once I've got the sheet design finalized, 
this isn't the final design. The next one I'm going to show you probably isn't the final design. But once I've got it finalized, I'll do a kind of mirrored version for left-handed people so that they won't have this much, their entire sheet, to rewrite their hit point totals or whatever either. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good point. And it's like uh, accessibility concerns, I think, are... Uh, and I speak for myself, uh, but I think I speak for a, a lot of people, are, are, are kind of low on the list of, like, what are the big priorities in completing my sheet, um, both because, uh, you know, some of us don't have it directly affecting us, so we don't think of it, which is on us to, to solve for ourselves, um, but also because uh, there's a lot of accessibility stuff that you kind of have to do some research on to figure out. Like, I do most of my sheets... Uh, in, in grayscale, you know, black and white. Uh, but if I were to do a color sheet, like, and if that was very important for, for the game, that's something that's like, uh, you know, I have, I know that, like, board games are a problem for some people who have color blindness because, like, tokens are too close of a color or cards are too close of a color together and that kind of thing. So I think that's, like, the next evolution of, like, we have a lot of very programmatic uh, kind of, like, spatial and, like, layout stuff that, that I think there's a lot of kind of... There's a good body of wisdom about how to do those things pretty well. And it's easy to look up resources on that. And then, like, accessibility is, like, the next uh, sphere that we need to start working on collectively as designers to, to, to do better work. So I'm glad you're thinking about that. I remember you posting about that and being like, that's awesome. I need to do stuff like that myself. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, start off by showing uh, this, the same sheet again and actually show you the second page, which is where some of the big changes happened. Uh, so I'll go ahead and share that again. So I've got the, the character sheet here with the kind of static character concept information. So this is where you record the character name, your name as the player, and start to record some descriptive information here. And I've got a little block here, a couple of lines for your character concept. Uh, and then I've, it sort of breaks from this character setup information and gets into actually uh, rules text. So, and these are sort of reminder rules for some of the most important stuff that you're going to be doing during the game. Unfortunately, I didn't do a great job with this layout of actually separating those out. So it, it wasn't immediately obvious to everyone that that's what that was. Uh, and then I've got more rules text that's connected to these uh, point totals over here that are going to be changing all the time. And as I talked about here, I've got the kind of basic attributes, the skills. Uh, and, and most people were able to determine during my blind testing pretty easily how the uh, you have these pairs of attributes that feed into another one. You just add them together. So during the blind testing, that was really well received by everyone. Most of this information over here uh, You'll see, you'll see that very little happened to change on the right side of the sheet over here and very little change in the middle. But most of the changes happened over here uh, on the left-hand side where things were a little bit confusing. People didn't quite get what was going on. Uh, and a, a quick note before I go on and show everything else. Uh, I don't just do the blind testing. I also uh, you know, take feedback during and after play. So I'm, I'm getting the same kind of feedback you guys are using, but I'm also trying to get this additional source of feedback that happens before people play, before they're familiar with the game, so that um, I can sort of understand what the sheets are saying, what the play materials are saying about the game visually without having the, without people necessarily filtering it through what I've told them about the game. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and show the second page of this sheet, if I can get it to scroll. There we go. Uh, so on this second page, I've got this huge blank area here for a portrait. I've got the unspent resource points filling up here. And this whole right side is very busy. doesn't say a whole lot. Or it actually says a lot, but it's very dense. Um, and a lot of the comments about it, both during the feedback, the blind feedback, and during play were that the density of it, the weight of everything in there, made it sort of difficult to figure out which sections were supposed to go together that, you know, this horizontally is one section, but that's not necessarily obvious, and it wasn't well separated from the section below it, so that didn't work very well during uh, playtesting. 
And I've also got these dotted lines here that people weren't sure what was going on there. But I've also got, on the front of this sheet, this dotted line. And I'll actually show you physically uh, one of the sheets. Let me uh, stop sharing that so I can show you on camera uh, what that was for. I've got one of the sheets here. It's a little bit filled in. Uh, front and back. And my sheet for this game actually uh, folds over so that you can reference the quick reference stats for your powers and items uh, and still have all the sort of relevant um, quick reference rapidly changing values on there so that you don't have to have everything sort of piled onto the front of the sheet. You can have the longer descriptions for all your powers and gear and not have to be looking at that same side of the sheet while you're actually playing. Uh, but that wasn't well communicated by the sheet itself, and I don't want to trust that once I publish the book out into the wild that everyone will figure out that that's what you're supposed to do with the sheet. Did, uh, did you find that people just flipped the paper over during play? Uh, yes, actually. A, co a couple people did until they saw someone else uh, oh, okay. folding the sheet over. It was only when they saw someone else holding it over that they started doing it themselves. Because mm -hmm. I think most people, that's that's not a thing most people look for when they have some experience with role-playing games. They don't look right. for the sheet to be manipulated in some way during play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a... Uh, thinking about the expectations of your audience is part of the process, for sure. Because um, I've done some, like, some stuff like that where, like, the sheet... Uh, you you fold up the sheet because part of it like is for because uh, so, it's like hidden information and like people across the table can see what's on like one side and but they can't see what's on the other side and that kind of thing and there's always a lot of uh, verbal explanation to like what that is and why that is because people are very uh, used to you know a sheet of paper that is flat and you flip over to access the two sides. Yep, exactly. So I'm going to go ahead and share the uh, updated version of the sheet that I created after I got some of that feedback. And like I said, the feedback happened both uh, before play, uh, the sort of semi-blind feedback, and also during play, what I saw people doing. Um, so here I've actually labeled the character sheet so that people know what game it's for and what's going on. Uh, I've actually added a little icon here that sort of indicates to people that they should be folding the sheet. Uh, and s sort of strengthened the dotted line, actually. I've also slightly moved it so that there was actually an issue with the margin of the page covering up some of this information over here with the older version because I hadn't spaced everything correctly, so I hadn't properly accounted for the margin. But I've done that with this revision. And you'll see that most of the rules text has been completely removed from this area. It's actually been moved to the back of the sheet. And I've condensed the three lines I had for character concept into something more concrete, so a starring role and a supporting role. During character generation for the game, you actually figure out what you're doing when it's your turn to star in the action, and then what you are what you do when you support someone else. So that's, that's the process for coming up with your character concept. So instead of just having a blank space for concept, I just made the sheet about the actual process. Uh, so this area of the sheet is where most of the big changes happen. Uh, over here, I actually just the sheet was feeling very heavy and very sort of claustrophobic, claustrophobic. So I went ahead and just switched up some of these items over here into grayscale to lighten the look and feel of the sheet. Uh, determined that we didn't need nearly as many rows for wounds and damage as I had on there before. So I uh, reduced the number, made it only one column worth instead of two columns worth, uh, and actually increased the size of it a little bit so it's easier for people to fill in. Uh, but everything else over here on the sheet is otherwise identical and follows this original sort of design philosophy. And nothing else on the sheet really changed dramatically between the other, uh, between these iterations. And if I go to the back of the sheet, uh, you'll see that the rules text that used to be on the front is now on the back instead of that big empty spot for a portrait. There's a little spot for notes down here. The space for the unspent resource points has been moved down to the bottom. Part of that's, again, so that people aren't reaching all the way across the sheet and blocking most of the sheet with their arm to try to fill that in. 
Uh, but it's also because people expect numbers like that to be sort of near the bottom of the sheet for whatever reason. Uh, maybe from old D&D character sheets where your gold was always at the bottom of the sheet. But I've also used the same kind of grayscale lightening things up over here to indicate that this is a single solid unit so that you've got these heavy black dividing lines that do a better job of offsetting these things from each other. I've removed the dotted line here because that was providing too much of a separation between the description and effects and the actual sort of technical details of a power uh, so that now it's easier for users to see that those are, that's a single stat block there in a way. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing here. And uh, do you have some examples of sheets, kind of old version, and then talk about some of the feedback you got and show a new version? Yeah, I, I, I pulled some up on my end, which we'll see if this thing works. And maybe, uh, Phil, you can jump in while I'm talking about them. Uh, so let me see how this works. Hold on. Um, all right. I think we can see here. So <clears throat> this is uh, one of the original sheets that Phil sent me. Um, and uh, and this is actually, yeah, I think this is the most recent one that, that you sent me. Um, they all yeah, kind of look like this. Right. <laughs> What's that? Uh, and then on this side, this is a, a mid, midway revision. Um, or maybe this was the first one. I don't remember exactly. I just opened these really quick, so I'm not sure what... Uh, I think that might even be one of the first revisions. That the might one. be... Oh, because I didn't send you the very first one because it was garbage. So this is... The first one you saw uh, <laughs> is this one. So this is the kind of thing where I was saying I was kind of doing a lot of interpretation between these two, uh, kind of, you know, I have like a visual look that we already worked out because we already started working on the the, the, the logo design and some of the, the graphic um, assets for the book itself. So that's kind of, uh, you know, so we have the work in progress logo on here uh, and that's kind of driving some of this um, faux 70s or possibly 80s uh, kind of classic sword and sorcery-ish uh, look, but um, yeah, past that, you know, I had to do some stuff like uh, how the skill, the, the skill ranking thing works and how skills are organized. Um, I think this came out of a lot of play testing of like how to organize the, the, the skills um, that your characters have. So I didn't really want to mess with the arrangement because that seems to me uh, to, to have a bunch of, of play behind it. Um, but kind of expanding it out to be a, have a little more room to breathe and um, uh, a little more room to write and that kind of thing. Um, but I kind of had to interpret like you know you have these bars here uh, that's implying that you know every uh, that these are are important um, you know in some mechanical way. So that's why these are grayed out on on this because you also have the stars, and we, we need to work out exactly the details of all of that information is needed or not, but that was one example of that bridge. Um, and yeah, so just kind of interpreting the sheet and, and turning things into uh, something that had a little more space to breathe and was a little more sorted out by these different areas of, of what you're going to be interacting with during play. Um, and then... This is the m most recent revision that uh, I just sent you, um, I think yesterday. So in between these two, there was a, a revision that had even more information on it uh, that kind of got packed in and was even busier and had more going on. Um, and then we actually took a bunch of that out uh, and did a bunch of condensing based on Phil's feedback about like these aspects. Um, between the two basic, the, the core concept and the trouble, uh, you know, you got back to me and was like, well, you could have other aspects, but there's really only one that matters, and it's about your kingdom, and I think I'm going to call it legacy or something. So we condense that down to one line that says legacy, and we'll see if that's, you know, enough for, for all the characters that you have in your campaign. Um, 
there's never going to be more than four uh, skills of level four or five or six. So this is like a place to, you know, we'll probably be able to put a little more something in there if we need to, but, um, you know, freed up some space there and that kind of thing. And a bunch of other, like the relationship stuff got streamlined a lot. Um, the asset stuff got got changed a bit and that kind of stuff. So I don't know, Phil, if you have any any other input here. As you can see, I, like kind of the grouping became more specific and also doing different levels of information on the first read. You can see on this, uh, everything kind of has the same weight and kind of the same importance. And then on this sheet, uh, the supplementary instructional text is is on a you know a less important eye drawing level than the the headers, than the titles, etc. So. Yeah, there, there's definitely a much stronger visual hierarchy in that updated mm -hmm. sheet that sort of leads the eye around and lets people know where they're supposed to be looking for what level of information. Right. Yeah. Phil, can you actually uh, talk about some of the things you either saw or didn't see during play that uh, drove some of these changes? Yeah, sure. Um, so you saw the first sheet that I sent Nathan, which um, shows off my pretty awesome graphic design skills. That's a little something called Publisher, Microsoft Publisher. Pretty sweet. I have kind of the Excel sensibilities. Um, but I think that that um, you know a lot of a lot of what happened through play is you know just realizing how how much real estate each of these different elements really need. Like you were mentioning you had that initial, you know, wound tracker um, on your sheet and it was about twice the real estate that you needed, right? And so I had something similar with relationships where I was like, oh, okay, so you have relationships with other characters and that'll be an important thing and there'll be all these slots and you can take them for stunts and and what happened was it 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 was just too too many and it was a little unwieldy, so you know you realize like you can just start. I just cut out a lot of, like the real estate got trimmed down a lot by. Um, it wasn't even direct feedback about this wasn't necessary. It's just as you you know iterating on it more and more and more, you realize like no one's leveraging this space ever, and so. There's just there's just no reason to keep it around, um, and I think that sums it up more than anything. And then also even the core aspects for a character sheet, um, you know, I think I started with with five or or something, which I think is what Fake Core has, um, but but uh, the Kingdom has aspects, and so there again it was just um, people it, you didn't they they didn't really need uh, characters didn't really need to have that many aspects because by by having a kingdom that had aspects, uh, if the character has too many, then you don't look to the kingdom as much to invoke and like it doesn't become as much of a focal point. So it was kind of important to to make sure that there. That's kind of what I was getting at with like there being these two uh, levels of design where you have this this kind of organizing principle this this kingdom or society and so you also don't you also want to make sure that not only you know is your is your one sheet working for the player but does it does it overlap or draw away from uh, the society because it because it, at the at the end of the day I wanted it to be you know at least as much about the kingdom as it was about a character in the kingdom um, so, oh, and then, yeah, so Nathan has yeah, the, so um, I'll, I'll talk there's a, pops up. a stronghold sheet there. Yeah, so this yeah. is the, the stronghold sheet on, on this side, uh, which, you know, is is a character, right? Like, it has kind of the an equivalent amount of information um, on, on here. So, uh, yeah, I guess I'm just kind of talking to pop it up so you can see it. Um, one aspect of it, like we I've were talking about... I've actually got it forced to your screen, so anyone can talk and it'll stay on your oh, screen good. for a moment. Ah, uh, okay. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, so this, uh, like we were saying earlier, where there's, like, information that you want to preserve in between sessions, this has more of that kind of going on to it. There's, um, 
you know, there's some there's some there's some static information that just comes from the game, right? So that can all be right on the sheet, and you don't have to reference it in the book. Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, some some overall resource totals that are important in the longer term play, and that kind of thing. So it's kind of a uh, almost half and half between like stuff that's going to change maybe during a session and then stuff that's going to you know be a little longer term. Um, so yeah, yeah it's an example of that. Okay, so so having uh, kind of multiple sheets that a player will be referencing during play. I'll come back. Uh, Phil, can I actually get you to talk a little bit about how you see people doing that at the table, like how, how they actually go from their character sheet to the kingdom sheet and back. Yeah, so that's been uh, one of the bigger design hurdles. Um, so the game itself, it's kind of a, it's, it's, it is, I mean, it is a, it is a role-playing game, but it's pretty board gamey. Um, there, there's kind of this, this initial part where you get all these different colored dice for your resources and you roll them and you build stuff but there's a lot of like dice shuffling that goes on and it's kind of a little mini game and um, and then there's kind of this freeform story part of it and then there's kind of this conflict like adversarial part of it um, but uh, the, the tricky the tricky part has been um, deciding how to represent that information for each of those um, elements in the game. I know um, it, it was kind of like what I was saying. When when certain information is on the sheet, it, it becomes more important. And for a while, I had it... Uh, certain things buried in the book that um, were kind of... I don't know how to describe it. Like, like they they were important sort of strategies for building this kingdom, or uh, or 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 just just ways to go about um, kind of a long term play. And because they were in the book, you know, it, it uh, they tended to get dominated by the couple of my friends who were the kind of people who would just open a PDF and like, you know, mine it for all this data. But everyone else would kind of just show up and be like, "Oh, uh, how about you just handle that and you build something for our kingdom?" And you know, eh, that'll be fun. Don't screw up. You know, don't screw it up for us. Um, but so it was important to take some of that out and make it e easily available so that um, everyone who who was there could participate in that. And then another. Part of that was some design changes where um, there's actually like a spotlight player that's sort of in charge of you know getting all those resource dice each session and rolling them and trading them around, and we make sure that person moves around so that you know the one play the, so that one player can't dominate the kind of strategy of the stronghold so that it, it's a little more engaging for everyone. But the the trickiest part with that has been. Um, uh, Making the information visible enough so that uh, you know a couple people could huddle around and actually see it at the same time. Um, and for a while, I had it just really crammed down, where it uh, it it's just hard to see. And so you know that that's kind of gone back and forth. And I think it's it's at a pretty good spot right now. But but if anything, that's probably one of the trickier parts. It's still it still probably is a little hard for everyone to do it at the same time um, and sometimes we'll just like I'll just bring a couple copies of something um, but uh, that that's that's one of the hardest parts about having that kind of central sheet I guess during play after that kind of initial board gamey part happens then it's not as important um, to sort of have everyone be able to look at it at the same time what usually happens is you know someone will Sort of say, oh, what, we're, what's that aspect we have right now? And then look at the sheet, or how much of this kind of resource do we have, or or how do we feel about this faction? And uh, that tends to be sporadic enough that as long as the sheet's centrally available, not everyone has to see it at the same time. Um, but yeah, that that's been a been a really a really tricky thing to think about. 
Oh, excellent. Okay, uh, so I, I think we've sort of gotten through the the sort of meat of how we go about playtesting a character sheet or otherwise user testing a character sheet, how we look at the feedback we're getting and how we use that to, to decide on changes and how we either implement them ourselves or how we would communicate that to someone we're working with to implement. Uh, I've shown the sheets I've uh, done for myself. Uh, you've shown some of the Wrath of the Arts arc sheets that you're doing for Bill. Uh, but I know you said you had some sheets from uh, Worldwide Wrestling, and I'd be really interested to see how those evolved from the early versions to the sort of current very, very uh, slick sheets that you have <laughs> got up there. Oh, thanks. Uh, okay, um, I'll take one second to pull those up because I realized my screen share will work, so you don't need my sad printouts over here that no one will be able to see anyway. Um, but one thing about that, because um, I think I still have the original original ones. Uh, so in that, in so for Worldwide Wrestling, which is a pro wrestling game, um, it's uh, powered by the apocalypse, so it's in it's in a design tradition. Uh, so it's in this um, apocalypse world uh, design uh, aesthetic and and motif, um, and that uh, means that the the character sheets I kind of kept with the at this point pretty standard powered by the apocalypse thing of their separate playbooks, right? They're separate uh, in my game. They're called gimmicks, so they're just they're all separate, so every gimmick has its own individual sheet, um, and so the challenge for that um, is to uh, Kind of standardize some things while leaving enough flexibility to do to to allow each unique um, playbook to have its own unique stuff because they they some of them have slightly different information than other stuff. So uh, I will open a thing. Sorry. Um, so this is the one of the very first playtest sheets. That's what I want. Uh, there we go. Um, so, uh, I, I can immediately see that you've gone for the sort of bifold <laughs> thing that most yeah. Uh, so this AWG is yeah, it's use. the bifold yeah thing. So you fold it in half. Um, and this was also uh, when uh, I originally had, you had two aspects to your character, you have your gimmick and your role, and those were actually two different sheets. So, um, so, if you're, so every baby face would have this sheet, uh, so these are, are double-sided, um, and you fold them in half, uh, so this is like uh, the, you can't see my hand because it's a screen share, this is like the front side, this is the back side. And uh, so the idea here was that there's a certain amount of information that kind of lives with your, um, you know, with your character kind of on a more uh, permanent basis, and then there's a set of information that changes, that can change in a session or, or multiple times uh, in a session. And so, that, so the role, since you can make a turn and turn from babyface to heal, I was like, oh, I'll put all that information on this sheet. So that's... Um, Stuff like you have specific moves, some heat, which is kind of your relationship stat, um, and then some adva your advancement stuff, which actually uh, does stay the same, but it's not something you need to look at all the time. It's just something that kind of doesn't matter which sheet you have. You're still going to have this information on it. While your gimmick sheet has, like, your... Uh, at the time, you had this thing, which was kind of your popularity with the audience, um, and then your stats and your specific moves and and all that business. Turns out that in play, not only was this a lot of paper to have on the table, um, so you have every every player has two sheets plus there's like two or three reference sheets for all the moves plus whatever you know the the um, creative the GM role has. Um, I'll talk about that while I pull up the other one. Um, so there was a lot of paper. Uh, so it was like usability was uh, not great. Um, so that was the first problem. And then uh, the second problem was just that 
the way that I'd split up that information was not really, it wasn't really helpful. Um, there wasn't enough differentiation between those two roles, the baby face and the heel, to, uh, to really n need that separate piece of paper for it, because it's kind of just one move once you really boiled it down. And that kind of was part of my design process, was boiling that down and, and getting to uh, what, the, uh, what those actually meant um, for the characters and everything. So I abandoned the split play put playbook thing and uh, you know, made the role thing just a move option um, and brought them down to the one double-sided sheet and decided to abandon the folding thing because that wasn't really getting me any, anywhere either. Uh, it wasn't splitting up the information in a very interesting way or a helpful way. Uh, so once I did that... Oh, good. I will screen share this. So, yeah. So this is the, these are the, the current final sheets. Uh, featuring some, some nice art. I was able to get great art from, uh, uh, from a comic artist um, and, and all that. But anyway, so uh, now the kind of the organizing philosophy for these is like this side, the, the front side, is more that static information that doesn't change very much um, and stuff that you just pick once. Uh, I mean, you can change it, but, you know, when you make your character, you just pick. Uh, so you have some, you know, check boxes to indicate things that you can just check off uh, or empty space to write. Try to leave a decent amount of empty space. Um, your stats. Uh, these things, so this information, your heat, does change, uh, but on not not super frequently. This changes in very infrequently. Um, and then your backside is your is is pretty much a bunch of rules. It's pretty much all the rules you need to know to to play your character. Uh, this plus a reference sheet, a shared reference sheet for fit for the the shared moves and everything. But again, using checkboxes to call out, you know, individual options, uh, reminder text about how many you can pick. Um, and uh, this is a, a long term, a, a little longer term thing. Um, boxes to record information or to, to do checks, I guess. You know, here's one thing where, like, maybe this could be different. Like, these are really just checkboxes, but they're big enough. Um, the reason these and these are so big is because they're a little more important. Um, they could be called out in a different way as well, but that's uh, one thing there. And then this momentum, this I actually use poker chips within play because it moves very quickly. You spend it, you get it back, you spend it, you get it back. Um, but I found that having a checkbox there, A, it gave an option if you're playing, you know, if you don't have chips or tokens to... to uh, uh, that so that you can write and you're not just writing in a margin, uh, and then also it just was made it uh, easier for people to understand that like this is a number that like is important to your character as opposed to just having text there. And then these I do uh, these are just because people were turning their sheet over uh, again and again to check what their stats were because they're rolling and adding a stat. So I added those down there. Uh, so that people don't need to do that every single time. Like, crap, what was my look again? And flipping the sheet over. Uh, so there's a quick reference there. So, Excellent. Yeah, uh, that's, that's I, I see that whether, whether it's by design or not, you've got some of the less static information further toward the edges of the sheet, whether that's further at the bottom on the front where the heat is, or mm -hmm. sort of on the, le you know, on the far edges uh, where you've got the, the audience or the momentum. It's all the way down near the bottom, uh, so that it's easy for people to to still see the rest of the sheet or look at something and read something with, when they've got their hand on it to change it. Yeah, I think that's kind of a, a a natural outgrowth of trying to to uh, have a uh, have some flow to the to how everything is arranged. Um, I'm not going to say that I consciously was like, yes, I need to put all of those things that change on the edges, but it. It, it, it did kind of happen organically as part of a process where 
you know, I have a basic two column layout with a couple things that break across the two columns when, you know, it's relevant to, to both areas and to break up the sheet so it's not just two, you know, squares of information. And then one thing, I'm going to pull up the, uh, the screen share one more time, um, that uh, was, was neat is that uh, on the front side, I had to, because I, you know, I, I gave a pretty loose parameters for the art, um, the front sides had to, I had to have enough flexibility to arrange the elements around the art without um, losing too much or encroaching uh, too much. So that's one reason why there, some of them have a lot of white space, uh, like this one has a pretty good amount of white space, because <clears throat> the, 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 the figure itself is, is in a certain way. Yeah. While uh, the anti-hero, she's very blocky with this extra element here, and actually, you know, so it ends up a little more crowded, which works for her. Um, and also just how alphabetically how it worked out all the, uh, the, the female drawn archetypes ended up at the beginning of the sheet, which I thought was, or beginning of the document, which I thought was kind of funny. But yeah, so I gave myself, the, so for the, the front thing, I kind of, you know, had all my blocks and kind of where they wanted to live generally, so that there's some consistency. But I gave myself a bunch of extra space so that I could, um, you know, move them around and, and highlight the art because the art was really important to me to get to get um, to get right. So. All right. Yeah. That's probably enough of my talking. Okay. <laughs> uh, so thank you both for joining me for this discussion. Uh, as everyone's seen, I've. Yeah, I, I put together videos like this about sort of creative projects I'm working on. Most of them aren't necessarily about game design. Some of them are about my illustration work. Some of them are about uh, stuff I'm building so I can shoot better photo reference. Um, but I try to do shows like this eh, once a month or so and get a video out. Uh, I also do some game design, as you've seen from the character sheet that I've been designing, and I've got no particular date that that might be out. It's still very much in playtesting. But it's a fairly stable design at this point. Most of it's minor tweaking and actually writing everything down, which is turning out to be the bigger challenge. Okay. So before we say goodbye, uh, can I have each of you just kind of plug anything you've got? Uh, Phil, if, if you could go ahead and give us like the sort of... You've talked enough about Autark that I think most people are going to have an idea what's going on in the game in the game and what it's about, but can you give us sort of the the sixty second sales pitch for your game? Yeah, sure. So um Wrath of the Autark, it's a kingdom building game. Um it's uh it's competitive. You work against the Autark player who has this giant empire bent on all the other players' uh destruction, and you fight against them. And uh I guess it will be kickstarting. I bet in September um, is my current guess, and I, I'm pretty confident about that. I've been working on it for a long time. I've actually got a beta rules are already online, and um, the changes are have been pretty minor. So, yeah, I feel good about it. And thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Excellent. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing that. Uh, Nathan, if you want to talk about uh, what you're still doing, what you're uh, doing now on Patreon now that you've sort of changed up your, your model there. Uh, sure, yeah, so that's my current, I guess, ongoing project. Um, so I, I changed my Patreon from a per-release model to the subscription model, because uh, the per-release model was not um, getting me to do better work faster, which was my original goal with it. Uh, so now it's more about, um, you know, I'm always... I'm always doing lots of things, and a lot of those things don't see the light of day, but that doesn't mean they're not important uh, to my creative process for the things that do make it all the way. And also, it doesn't mean that some, you know, someone who's interested in the kind of stuff I do might not want to pick it up and run with it themselves. So uh, the idea is if you like the kinds of games that I like to write um, and publish, such as World Wide Wrestling, uh, my gothic horror game, Annalise, uh, my micro game series, which is a bunch of small, weird, more fiction-oriented games. Um, it's all kinds of stuff. Uh, that's where you can kind of support me in being an independent producer, and the more support I have through Patreon, the more time I can spend doing cool stuff, um, and the less time I have to spend... Um, though I, I love doing freelance work, the less time I have to spend doing, like, hustling for it, and... Uh, taking on projects that, that might not be the best use of my skills. So 
that's my ongoing thing. Uh, or check out Worldwide Wrestling RPG. It's awesome. It's really fun. You can check it out if you're into wrestling or having fun or both. I can personally attest to that game being <laughs> pretty fantastic. And I, I'm not even normally a wrestling fan, but that game kind of perfectly captures uh, sort of what that's about. But also, it's sort of meta uh, role playing that you're you're role playing a character who's sort of role playing an in the ring character, and mm-hmm. it's really fantastic at sort of highlighting some of those issues. Yeah, if you're into like meta narrative, then it actually has a lot to offer you as well because you you. You are both playing and kind of authoring the script for your your character, uh, who fully knows that they are a fake character. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining me, both of you. And thanks to everyone who's uh, watching or will watch this in the future. And uh, the next video I'm going to put out is actually going to be sort of an edited uh, version, taking some of the audio and footage from this and showing you actually some of the uh, actual blind test footage that I shot of people actually looking at and reviewing my sheets. So that'll be up uh, hopefully before the end of April. Uh, Thanks everyone for joining us.